Hi, I'm Jack West, medical oncologist in Seattle, Washington, and I wanted to give a little context and uh, underscore the importance of the very recent FDA approval of Dervalimab, which is marketed as Infinzi, in the setting of stage three unresectable non-small cell lung cancer. Now, uh, just pulling back, when we look at the last 10 to 15 years, the standard of care in this setting has been a combination of at least two cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy and concurrent chest radiation to the uh, visible disease and the mediastinum, and this is about six or seven weeks worth of that treatment. When we give this approach, the cure rate is about 20 or 25 percent on our very best day. And uh, so, though we cure some patients and are happy about that, we certainly should be striving to do better, and we have, but it's been remarkably difficult to move beyond that point. And we have given uh, additional uh, systemic therapy, sometimes chemotherapy or targeted therapies. We've escalated the chest radiation or given it in different platforms, but all of these have failed to demonstrate a clear improvement in survival for patients or even a dramatic improvement in progression-free survival. And so our standard remained uh, chemotherapy and radiation. This really changed in September of 2017 when Dr. Luis Pazeres presented at ESMO of, of 2017 the results of the Pacific trial that was uh, simultaneously published by Scott Antonia and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the uh, Pacific trial randomized 713 patients who had received at least two cycles of platinum-based chemo with concurrent definitive chest radiation and didn't demonstrate progression of disease before that uh, time when they were evaluated and uh, did not have a drop in their performance status that precluded subsequent treatment, still uh, no, no other toxicity issues. And these patients were then randomized to either Dervalimab administered IV every two weeks for up to a year or IV placebo on that same two-week interval for a year. There were co-primary endpoints, the uh, first being a progression-free survival as determined by a blinded independent review committee, and the second being overall survival. And what we've seen so far has been the progression-free survival results because overall survival remains immature. But the reason that we got this FDA approval and it has uh, changed practice is because of the magnitude of the progression-free survival difference that was seen. And that's shown here. Uh, importantly, it's not just a statistically significant result that it's hard to really uh, see the separation. Here you have a major separation of the curves that uh, occurs by the first evaluation point in the first couple of months and is maintained over the entire time that we are evaluating or that the investigators are evaluating these patients. So specifically the hazard ratio here is 0.52 and that's uh, translating to essentially a doubling of the probability that a patient on the Dervalimab arm is doing well without progression of disease compared to the patients on the placebo arm. When you look at the median time before patients uh, demonstrated progression, it was 5.6 months on the placebo arm, and it's threefold higher at 16.6 months on the Dervalimab arm. What's also impressive is how sustained this benefit is. And of course, many of these patients are still uh, being followed closely and we need to get more follow-up, but when they reported on the 18-month progression-free survival, it's a 17% difference, 27% with placebo versus 44% with, uh, with Dervalimab. What is also important, though we don't have overall survival, is the time to new metastases or death. And uh, as you can see in the curve, the hazard ratio for this is also 0.52. So essentially a doubling of the probability that a patient is alive and without evidence of any new metastases when they're on Dervalimab compared to placebo. So the FDA approved this uh, regimen 
of durvalumab as consolidation, though there is not a specified duration associated with this. And I think it's going to be debatable and interesting whether oncologists and patients will wish to discontinue that therapy after a year. It certainly has uh, financial implications because this is a therapy that's going to cost over $100,000 a year. And uh, it's worth knowing whether A, patients are actually being cured with this, and B, whether there is a benefit to continuing it uh, beyond uh, a year or whether uh, less or more than that is the uh, most appropriate amount of time. So this is going to need to be clarified with further analysis of this study and uh, we need to see and will see the results of the survival in the Pacific trial. But I would say that this approach should be the new standard of care uh, in the meantime. Why? Well, first, the magnitude of the progression-free survival difference is uh, huge and it is sustained and it is accompanied by this significant difference in the time to new metastases or death. And I would say that this makes it overwhelmingly likely that there will be a difference in survival at two or three years. And the real question is whether it will also be associated with an improvement in survival at four and five and eight years. So what we don't know is whether this is actually curing patients or just uh, delaying the time before we see relapses. And we'll need to learn more. We will need to have some careful debate and discussion about the pros and cons of uh, continuing patients beyond a year as well. And I'd say I, I don't think that's going to be my practice. But I'm going to cover this question of the optimal timing and the significance of stopping after a year or continuing indefinitely in another video. I hope that's helpful. We're going to learn more. I'd welcome your comments and hope you'll be inclined to uh, like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and the other platforms uh, that you might see this on.